Back in 2011, a friend sent me a link to a rather intriguing game trailer. A meandering mythopoetic adventure known as Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery EP. Have you ever asked yourself why you purchased this machine? There are several reasons that you may be consciously aware of, but your subconscious knows the truth. I was immediately hooked, so of course I downloaded it and gave it a try. It starts off with this smoking character known as the Archetype. He introduces the game as an experimental treatment for acute soul sickness, which I've always thought was a fantastic hook. He explains that the game will consist of four sessions. And with that, session one begins. The game begins with your character, the Sivian, appearing out of nowhere. And from the first tap, this haunting melody kicks off, setting the tone for the rest of the game. I've always loved the way that the game subtly leads the player on. It begins with this dog, known as Dogfella, barking to get your attention and guiding you forwards. There's a weightiness and gravitas to the tone of the game, offset by a script that's at times rather daft and silly. Aided by some Morning. slightly over-the-top voice acting for characters okay. like Nogfella. But what do you think about blood sports? Everyone likes blood sports, right? You're not, you don't really have much to say either, uh, huh. Supposedly, the radio presenter Robert Ashley ad-libbed the whole thing, thinking that they would send him a proper script in due time, but they never did. Seems like you're having a good adventure, yeah? <laughs> The game gets off to a fairly gentle start as Logfella leads you up the old path. Punctuated by the occasional battle. I really love the puzzles in Sword and Sorcery. They're just the right balance between satisfying but not too complicated. Your quest is only revealed gradually over the course of the game. You're there to retrieve a mythic book known as the Megatome. Along the way you awake an ancient evil known as the Gogolithic Mass. One of the things that really struck me about this game is this concept known as adaptive music. There's this moment as this gentle piano introduction starts up, and it's only as the player moves on that the full tune kicks in, known as the prettiest weed. The music is really unique and striking. Throughout the game, the music responds to what the player is doing to great effect. And then, just like that, the curtains shut and you're told to go away, get some rest and come back another day. 
it's such an unexpected thing to encounter in a mobile game, which are normally trying to reel you in and never let you go again. But that little moment has stuck with me ever since. Session 2 features some slightly experimented gameplay. Now you're trying to hunt down these sylvan sprites hidden throughout the game world. Once you've tracked them all down, you have to tame the golden trigon. You find yourself in this slightly ridiculous situation of fighting a yellow triangle, which shouldn't be scary at all, and yet somehow they manage to make it feel utterly terrifying. There's something eerily otherworldly about this high resolution geometry and this otherwise pixelated universe. Session 3 introduces this other dynamic of connecting the game to the real world phases of the moon. And then there's further trigons to tame for the dark moon and the bright moon. Of course you can cheat by changing the date on your phone or using the in-game moon grotto. Along the way you meet other crazy characters like the Grizzled Boar. You also meet Jim Guthrie himself, the musician behind the game, playing at a rock concert or chilling by the fire. The other developers of the game also make a brief cameo. The game is a fascinating collaboration between Craig D. Adams, he's the eponymous Super Rubbers, uh, and this was his first game, which I find astonishing. Also with the musician Jim Guthrie, and then the folks at Capybara brought some experience in the form of Chris, John, Frankie and some others. One of the unique things about the game is the way that they really started with Jim Guthrie's music and then constructed the rest of the game around that in what they call this audio-visual alchemy between the game and the music. I've become slightly obsessed with this game over the years and one of the things I've loved is finding some old footage of what the game used to look like. It's really fascinating to see how it changed over time. I love seeing early footage of how different the battles used to be. There was also this slightly weird, almost 3D element that I'm glad they dropped. You also get some glimpses of how different the script used to be and how that changed fairly last minute. 
There's also some little clues in the in-game data files of an introduction that at some point they cut from the game. Little clues like this give us a glimpse into how different the game might have turned out, but I'm so glad it became the game that it is. I loved it all those years ago when I first experienced it on an iPad, and I still love it a decade later. It even inspired my own game set in the Garden of Eden, so I was delighted when I discovered that Craig Adams had always wanted to make his own game set in Eden. So we'll see if my game, The Serpent and the Seed, works out and if it manages to capture even a fraction of the magic of sword and sorcery. But I just wanted to take a moment to express my thanks to the whole team and all those who helped make this amazing experience that has brought so much joy to me and so many others over the years. I'm really excited to see this little glimpse from Craig Adams of some potential new content coming uh, to Sword and Sorcery in the future. If you have any theories at all as to what that might mean, I'd love to hear them.